we must always in all circumstances recognize that the enemy has been defeated and always operate from our position of victory and authority in Christ in part 2 of this message we discuss some reasons why we face setbacks and have casualties when engaging the enemy all right um <clears throat> let's turn in our bible to hebrews 13 hebrews 13 5 and 6 Uh, we'll read this and then uh, stand up and uh, make our declaration. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says here, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man can do to me. Notice uh what the writer says here. It says he's saying God has said something. He himself has said I will never leave you nor forsake you. So God's made a promise. He said I will never leave you nor forsake you. So in response what do we do? it says so that we may boldly say god is my helper and i will not fear what man will do to me so our saying is really in response to what he has said he has said i am your shepherd so we boldly say the lord is my shepherd i will not be in want he has said i am the lord your healer So we boldly say the Lord is my healer, right? So what we say is really a response to what God has already said. And that's the way our conversation, our communication should be always a response to what God has said concerning us, concerning our lives, uh concerning our situations, concerning our cir- circumstances. What has God said? Say what God says or what God has said. Amen. So we're going to stand up now and just make our declaration it's basically a collection of a few things God has said concerning us in his word. So we're going to join together as we make our declaration if you brought your bible up uh, bible hold it high up please and let's say this together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word. I believe his word, and I live by his word. Christ is my master and to him I am in absolute surrender in Jesus name amen god bless you, you may be seated please <clears throat> last sunday we brought to our attention uh just as a way of reminder that the enemy we are facing is really a defeated enemy that the lord jesus christ on the cross triumphed over satan and all his demons the work has been done he's completed that battle he's completed that victory and he did it not for himself but he did it for you and me so we could walk in his victory we also reminded us that uh, the lord has vested spiritual authority in our lives He's put that in us. He's granted that to us, spiritual authority. So uh, we have His name, and in His name we act on His behalf. We are seated with Him in heavenly realms. We are seated with Jesus in a place of spiritual authority. The Bible teaches us that, and also we are part of this church which Jesus is building. That He said, "I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail." against it. 
and we reminded ourselves, you know, that it's, the gates are stationary. The gates don't attack the church. The church attacks the gates. The church advances toward the gates of hell. Gates simply represent the power centers of hell, areas of demonic domination. So wherever we find these areas, the church has to be there. The church has to be out there advancing against those areas of demonic domination. And so uh, this is the kind of church Jesus is building to whom he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys of the kingdom, meaning authority of the kingdom. I'm giving it to the church. You and I as believers are vested with kingdom authority in our lives. And he said, as we go against the powers of darkness, they will not be able to restrain us. They will not be able to stop us. They will not be able to uh, stop an advancing church. And that's the reason why, as a people, we have to be looking out rather than just hiding together inside. Right? Because we are supposed to be going to the gates, not waiting for the gates to come to us. Amen? So areas of demonic domination, control in our own society, in our own city, in our own state, in our own nation. That's where we, as God's people, have to be. Whether it's in the world of business or education or government or media or arts or entertainment or whatever sphere of society that the enemy is dominating, that's where the church has to be making a difference, using the keys of the kingdom, the authority that's vested in us to undo what the devil is doing. Amen? That's where we're supposed to be. That's the church that he's, he's raising up. And so we talked about this. We talked about the fact that we have Christ defeated Satan on the cross. And that triumph, that victory has been given to you and me. And the authority has been vested in you and me. And we must always, in all situations, operate out of a position of victory and authority. In every situation, no matter how hard the battle is, no matter how intense the enemy may be coming against you and me, in all circumstances, always know the enemy is defeated and you and I are operating from a position of victory and authority. Always. Sometimes the battle is hard, but you still operate out of that place of victory and authority. Now, what we want to do this morning is address the other side of this whole thing, which is sometimes why, and this is just talking practically, real life, why does the devil appear so big? If he's a defeated enemy, why does he appear so big? Why is it that there are casualties? Why do we face setbacks? Why do we face uh, Challenges that almost cripple our lives in, 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 many, ways, in many ways than one. And, and why is it these things happen if indeed Christ has defeated the enemy and granted that victory to us? And if indeed Christ has arrested us as believers with authority, then why is it that, you know, around us uh, and sometimes in our own lives, we face setbacks, that we face challenges? Sometimes we ourselves face defeats in certain areas. Now, some of you say, Pastor, you're talking unbelief. No, no, listen. Let's face up to the fact. Sometimes things, these things happen, and we need to find out what's the reason. Why do these things happen? And then we need to press through into what God really wants us to walk in. Now, in attempting to answer this and, and, and just talking about this this morning, I, I want us to begin with the standard that God wants us to live at with the absolute level at which we're supposed to walk, the invitation God has given to us. Our invitation is revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our standard. He is the life that we are supposed to be living. He, he lived the life that we are supposed to be living. That's the standard. That's what you and I must press into. And you and I will quickly admit that the Lord Jesus Christ faced no defeats. Amen? There was no defeat in his life. There was not even one occasion when he told somebody, you know, I'm sorry, this devil is too strong for me. Find somebody else. He never did that. 
There was no defeat in his life. And if that's the kind of walk he walked, then our, God's invitation to us is come up and walk this kind of a life. Live here. And so our goal is to press in to that kind of life. That we want to walk in, in a place of victory and dominion and authority where there are no defeats. But we're making our journey. Along the way, we may have some defeats. But they, the defeats we have all along the way will not stop us from pressing into God's invitation. We're getting there. The other thing you and I will quickly admit uh, about the life of Jesus Christ as we see revealed in the Gospels is that demons trembled. Wherever he went, demons trembled. They recognized that somebody has walked into the room who has absolute mastery, absolute dominion over their works, and they will have to vacate. They recognize that. Now, it may not happen all the time, and you and I walk into the room. At least not yet. But our call, our invitation is to live that kind of a life, to walk in God, so that when you and I enter a room where demons are, uh, you know, having a heyday, where demons are doing what they're doing, they will recognize that somebody has stepped in who has the authority of heaven in them and has, had, and has the authority to cast them out, to release people who are being oppressed. So that's the standard. That's the life we are called to enter into. And that's what we are pressing into. And, and, and as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2.14, and it's not on the screen, but Paul says, <clears throat> Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. He always causes us to triumph in Christ. So that's the life we are called to live. And that's what we are entering into God. I'm going to come into that place where I see victory. You always cause me to triumph. That's what I want to walk into. That's the kind of life I want to live. Because that's God's word for us. So as we press in. Yes. Sometimes the devil, the enemy looks a whole lot stronger. Sometimes there are casualties. Sometimes uh, things happen that, uh, that challenge this whole truth. That we have victory and authority in Christ. And why does it happen in the lives of God's people? Here are some reasons that we must be aware of. The first one that I, that I would like to point out is that sometimes as believers, we are ignorant of the truth. We are ignorant of God's word and who we really are in Christ. You know, we could be going to church Sunday after Sunday. We could be going to, uh, you know, we may have become believers and, 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 and received Jesus Christ into our lives and, and, and we are born again and sure we are saved and we are going to heaven and all of that is, is, is true. But sometimes we don't know beyond that. We don't know the truth. The fact that Christ has crushed the head of the serpent and, and granted us the victory and the fact that we have authority and we are not taught that, we are not given that truth and therefore, although we are indeed believers and we have been born again, we don't go past that initial experience of Jesus as Savior and we don't come into that place of where we live our life out of who we are in Christ. And what happens? God said very clearly in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, he said, My people are destroyed for a lack of programs. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Or Isaiah puts it this way, Isaiah 5 and verse 13, he's, God says, My people have gone into captivity. <coughs> They are held enslaved. They have gone into captivity. Why? Because they have no knowledge. The issue is about knowing the truth. About what God has spoken to us in his words. That, that's the underlying issue. So although we see good people, they're sincere believers, they love God, they may be regular in going to church, and, and truly they are saved, they love Jesus, they, they believe in, in what Christ has done for them on the cross, because they don't go past that, and, and embracing the truth of the word, or even being taught that, uh, they could be 
destruction in their lives. There could be cap- areas of captivity in their lives. And it's not God's fault. It's not that God hasn't done what he needs to do for us. It says that we don't know the truth. And it, that's, being destruct- that's destroying us. Sometimes we could even be going to a church like this where we try our best to uh, expound the truth of the word of God, to bring out the truth of the word and, and talk to us over and over and over again about who we are in Christ and, 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 and delve into those, the, those depths and, and, and try to explain it in several different ways. Hopefully in some way at some point it will hit us. You know. uh, but we could even be going to a church like this. But yet, if we are not careful, the Bible said, and Jesus said this, he said that Satan comes and steals the word that was sown. So it's not enough to go to a place where the word is being sown. It's important to retain the word that is sown into your heart. So that's why people could keep coming to a church like this. They could keep hearing the word and still not experience victory and breakthrough why it's it's the problem is not that this word is not being sown the problem is you got to retain that word hold on to that word in your heart because there is an enemy who wants to steal the word that is being sown. let's take it off oh thanks God. thanks God. all right so that's one problem a second problem is this. Sometimes we are ignorant of Satan's tactics. Of how the enemy operates. True Christ has triumphed over him. And true Christ has given us the victory. And uh, true we have uh, spiritual weapons and armor. But if we are ignorant of how the enemy operates. That could put us at a disadvantage. And Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. He said... Not being, uh, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, uh, for we are not ignorant of his devices or his schemes or his tactics. So just to put that in a simple statement, when we as believers are ignorant of Satan's tactics, of how he would move, it puts us at a disadvantage. And so, as believers, we must always be on guard and try to preempt what the enemy would try to do against us. So we got to think militarily. How would the enemy try to make inroads into my life? Now, I'm at this position in life. I, I have all these things going around in my situation, my life. What possible ways would the enemy try to to make inroads at this point. Got to think that way. And always be on guard. The Bible says be sober. And be vigilant. Be on guard. Be alert. Because there is an enemy. So sometimes we are ignorant of the enemy's schemes. And suddenly he makes an inroad. And things happen. Sometimes we think we know how to fight. But then the scenario may be different from the previous time in life. It may be very different. So one thing I do, <clears throat> and I believe we must do, as we come into new situations in life, we say, God, I've never been in a situation like this before. God, how do I fight this battle? Give me wisdom. It takes wisdom to win the war. Wisdom from God. Say, God, I know, how to, I know about my weapons. I know I have the name of Jesus. I have the word of God. I have the blood of Christ. I, I, I know about the power of the, the spoken word. Those I know. But what is the wisdom I need to win this particular battle I'm fi- facing now? Or what is the wisdom I need to walk in in this stage of my life to preempt what the enemy may attempt to do against me? So... I don't walk in ignorance, but God by his spirit alerts me. God by his spirit alerts you and tells you, here, be on guard in this area. Be on guard in that area. Put up your shield of faith there. Put up your defenses up there. Or stay out of this. Stay out of that. He is guiding you so that you can walk in victory over the enemy. So it takes wisdom. 
And if we are ignorant of Satan's tactics, his ways, uh, then we are at a disadvantage. Now, just to mention here, there are several common tactics the enemy uses, and just list some of them. For instance, accusation and condemnation is one of Satan's biggest tactics. Condemns us. Condemnation. That means you are no good. And sometimes some sermons help the devil too. <laughs> if you didn't get that, it's okay. <laughs> so the devil's tactics is tell people they are no good. Condemn them. Put them down. He is called the accuser of the brethren. So accusation that condemns, that puts people down. That's the tactic. So you want to, you're coming Sunday morning, you're coming to lead in prayer. And as soon as you get out the home, out your door, a thought comes, hmm, yesterday you spent two hours watching the match. India barely made it. <laughs> and you are going to go and lead in prayer? What a hypocrite. Stay home. You know? Condemnation. And then you come in the morning. Oh God, I am so unworthy, God. Come on. Don't live life under condemnation. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation puts you down. Conviction lifts you up closer to God. Condemnation pushes you away from God. Conviction draws you into the presence of God. Saying, get right with God. Keep going. So, that's a tactic. Another simple tactic that the enemy uses against God's people is intimidation. You don't have what it takes. Intimidate. Put fear. Make you feel very small. Unfit and un, un, unfit, incapable of taking on the task that God's put before you. And so the enemy uses that tactic of intimidation. No, you can't do it. Oh, no, it will not work this time. And, and intimidates us. And so, so many of us, God's people, we just feel so crippled. We don't want to do anything. We don't want to step out. We don't want to take risks. We don't want to uh, take up a challenge or an opportunity God puts before us. Because even before you can think, uh, you know, start working towards it, the devil says, you don't have what it takes. Leave it for somebody else. Intimidates you. And keeps us down. Very simple tactic. Another thing the devil uh, uses against us is to deceive us. Deception. Deception is simply getting us to believe a lie. So he speaks a lie and we believe it. We, we, we just embrace it. Sometimes even unknowingly we embrace the lie of the devil and that takes us down. Paul was very uh, uh, jealous or very cautious about the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. He says, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds will be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So Paul is so concerned about the Corinthians. He says, I don't want the devil to deceive you just the way he deceived Eve. I, I want, I'm watching over you. I don't want you to be deceived, taken away from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. So the enemy deceives us. He causes us to believe a lie. Things like, you know, you will never be successful. It's God's will for you not to succeed. So you believe that lie. And you settle for a life of mediocrity. Somebody asks you, why? Why aren't you pressing? Why aren't you pushing? No, no, it's God's will to be for me to be like this. And you don't know that God actually said, that if you are a man who believe, uh, delights in his word, you will be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings one fruit every year. <laughs> no, that, that brings its fruit in its season. Your leaf will not wither and whatever you do will prosper. But that's the truth which God has spoken to you. But the devil whispers a lie saying, God's will for you. 
it's okay, half a fruit every year is enough. <laughs> And we embrace that lie and we settle for a life of mediocrity or a settle for a life that isn't the full potential that God has placed in us. We settle for something less than God's best and we think that's enough. But we've actually embraced a lie. And so he keeps us defeated, keeps us down and robs us of the destiny and the fullness of God's purposes for our lives. Deception is just another thing. So we must not be ignorant of, uh, of lies. And you know, every time we believe a lie, we empower the father of lies. Every time you believe the truth, you empower the father of truth to work in your life. Every time you believe the lie, you empower the father of lies to do some damage in your life. So, Let's embrace the truth. Let's say, no, this is what God's word says. This is what I'm going to press into. I may not be there yet, but that's the truth. And that's what I'm going to press after. I will not embrace the lies of the enemy. Let's be focused on the one who is the truth. A third reason why uh, the enemy sometimes causes us to be defeated in our lives, although Christ has granted us the victory and authority, is because of entry points that we grant to the enemy. Sometimes these are known and sometimes these are unknown. Paul writes to the believers in Ephesians 4 and verse 26 and 27. He says, do not, and be angry, do not sin, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And verse 27 he says, and give no place to the devil. Whose responsibility is it not to give place to the devil? Our responsibility. You as a believer... We as believers must make sure that we give the devil no access, no entry point. The literal word there means don't give him any foothold in your life. So devil, no. Not even a foothold. Give no place to the devil. Sin opens up the door to the devil. Right? One of Satan's names is Beelzebub. Its translation means the father of filth or the lord of the flies that hang around the filth. He's Beelzebub. He's like the big boss of all the flies. The lord of the filth, the lord of the dung. Now, here is simple logic, very simple. There are one of two ways to get rid of flies. You can spend all your time chasing the flies away. Or you can get rid of the filth. Revelation, right? So, most of us, what do we do? We keep chasing the flies. That fly of, you know, we, call, we try to just get the names of the flies. You know, what name? Check your great-grandfather's history. You know, dig your roots. Oh, that fly is the fly of some inherited sin. Ah, so we waste all our time in that. We do all of that. Because we want to get the names of the flies to chase them out. You know? And we are so busy chasing flies. And really, all you need to do to get rid of the flies, get rid of the filth. The flies won't come. Amen. Get rid of the filth. What is it that's bringing the flies? If as a believer there is sin in your life, stop chasing the flies. Get rid of the filth. The flies will stop coming. Because he's called the Lord of the flies, Beelzebub. So sin is an entry point. Now, most of us, don't have some obvious sins. I mean, you don't chew pan, you, know, you don't drink, you don't smoke. Uh, all of the obvious things have all been cleaned up. But you know, sometimes it's the not so obvious things that become entry points into our lives. So what do you mean? Anger, hatred, jealousy, Unforgiveness. Things that we carry inside us become entry points. 
and here's what the bible says you know uh, a big thing in most lives is this thing called strife strife at home and strife in the church also and strife which is birth out of two things it is birth out of a thing called jealousy and it's birth out of a thing called selfish ambition jealousy and selfish ambition cause strife and you know what james says in james chapter 3 he says where envy and selfish ambition is there is every evil work and see it's in your bible where envy and selfish ambition is there is every evil work meaning all hell is present so we've got believers we've got all of people we've got churches we got you know where where we are operating actually out of envy and selfish ambition and every evil work happens and we're busy trying to chase the devil really it's not about that it's about closing the door it's denying the right of access to deny the right of access what must we do get rid of envy and selfish ambition am i right get rid of that get rid of envy jealousy and selfish ambition now remember james is writing to believers so don't pretend believers don't have it so you attend to hours we attend to hours of church service hallelujah we have won the victory 2 minutes walk to the car the door is shut and strife begins like god whatever happened to the hallelujahs <laughs> but that strife is so dangerous why because it gives the enemy access to release all kinds of evil work so on the outside everything looks nice right and we can talk say the same thing about preachers right so when he preaches there is holy fire when he goes home there's a different fire <laughs> i'm talking about preachers right and then we wonder why did this happen to that preacher because there was a different fire falling at home which opened the door to every kind of evil work in his house and so none of us are exempt from this it applies to all of us that we must give no place to the devil keep strife out of your life keep envy selfish ambition keep it out because where envy and selfish ambition is the bible is so clear it gives room to every kind of evil work in our lives so we got to be careful and now there are unknown entry points which I think sometimes it's more easier to deal with than the known. The unknown has to do with, you know, some prayers that may have been prayed over your life, some dedication, some sacrifices, some that may have been done in the past over your life and you you're you're not even aware about it. And that's easier to cancel because all you have to do is rededicate yourself to the Lord. So you when you rededicate yourself to Jesus and say Lord I I'm consecrating my life to you I'm canceling every other dedication everything that may have been spoken over my life in the past known or unknown you're canceling all of that and you're presenting yourself to God that's easier than getting rid of envy and selfish ambition Unfortunately more believers are worried about the unknown than what is very obvious They spend more time trying to dig about dig up unknown things which are more easy to deal with than dealing with some of the very obvious things in our lives that have to deal with selfish amb- ambition and jealousy and these are very very 
uh, big because they open the door to every kind of evil act. And number four, just getting ready to close here, uh, is learning how to wage a good warfare. It's not enough to fight. We need to fight with wisdom. And we need to fight correctly in, in, in the realm of the spirit. Uh, we know, for instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, that we've got weapons that, that have been given to us by God. Paul writes here, he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So we don't fight a spiritual enemy with natural weapons. We use spiritual weapons to engage a spiritual enemy. And uh, verse 4 says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So God indeed has given us weapons as believers. He's given us weapons which are mighty in God. I mean, these are powerful weapons through which we can actually pull down. We can demolish demonic strongholds. So it's not a question of whether these weapons are powerful enough. They are mighty in God. And they are capable of demolishing strongholds. But we must learn how to use them correctly. He said these weapons, with these weapons we can cast down imaginations. We can take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So God's given us weapons to walk in absolute victory and triumph. But we must learn how to wage warfare correctly. So sometimes there are casualties simply because we fight the wrong way. Unfortunately, in the body of Christ, uh, when, uh, when God unveils a truth that is resident in his word and he opens it up to the body, uh, there's always a, a segment of the body of Christ that takes that word to an extreme. So that's happened in the case of spiritual warfare as well, where the, the, the truth concerning spiritual warfare is real, but then there are segments of the body of Christ who take it to an extreme. So you have people who say, you know, you've got to go up to the highest floor in the tallest building on your city to bind the, the powers over your city, right? You've probably heard some of these strange things, you know? So you have all these strange ways of engaging with the enemy. Sometimes you have to fly over in a helicopter because you're waging war against the prince of the power of the air. People have done all that in the past. Some people even do it today. All right. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with the truth concerning spiritual warfare, but when we take it and start, you know, going off on a tangent with it, we get into error. And so that's happened with almost every truth that God's unveiled from the Word. And so, so in in, the, in 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 engaging with the enemy, sometimes we step out of our boundaries. We step out of what we're supposed to be doing, and we get into the areas where we are not supposed to be engaging, or the ways in which we're not supposed to be engaging with the enemy. And then we have casualties, and then we wonder why these things are happening. It's because we are stepping out of our own boundaries that God's given to us, the perimeters of our authority in engaging with the enemy. So the best thing is stay with the basics. Stay with the truth of the word. Don't go off on an extreme. Stay with the word. Be strong in the word. Learn how to engage the enemy correctly. Use wisdom. Ask God for wisdom in learning how to fight a good warfare. As we engage the enemy, it takes faith. Uh, even the disciples who at one point were unable to deliver a man, they asked the Lord, Lord, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus' response was, because of your unbelief. So it takes faith in dealing with the enemy. So build up your faith in the word of God uh, and, and in those areas where you're experiencing conflict so that we can have victory in those areas. Sometimes it takes persistence. Daniel prayed 21 days. He, he engaged in that intensity of prayer that, and, and being persistent in what he was after because there was a battle going on in the realm of, uh, in the spiritual realm, the unseen realm, which he probably was not aware of, but he just pressed through until he got the answer. So sometimes, the conflict can be a little longer than we would like because there is a battle going on in the realm of the spirit and we have to fight through to victory. Don't give up just because the battle is a little longer than what you and I anticipate. So, what's the point here? The point is here this morning is simply this. God has 
given you and me victory and authority in Christ there is no question about it in every situation you and i must operate out of a sense of victory and authority always in every situation god is going to cause you to triumph but do it keeping these other things in mind which is embrace the truth of the word keep on growing in the truths of the word of god because a lack of knowledge can destroy us secondly learn how to engage the enemy learn understand don't be ignorant of satan's tactics Pro- understand discern what the enemy may be doing be proactive preempt what the enemy could do against you in order to walk in a life of consistent victory and authority thirdly be careful of opening the door up to the enemy unnecessarily be careful of the small things the bible says it's the little foxes that spoil the why sometimes we are going out there looking for big things when actually it's a small thing a small thing like selfish ambition a small thing like jealousy that actually opens the door to a big damaging work of the enemy be careful close those entry points as we are engaging uh the enemy and fourth fight correctly ask god for wisdom engage the enemy correctly uh don't step out into areas that you and i are not supposed to uh stay within the realm of that god has given to us use your faith use your persistence those are things we see uh, as means by which we must engage them maybe have faith or hold up your shield of faith be strong having done all to stand keep standing be persistent that's what the bible teaches us stay within those realm the perimeters of what god's word teaches us on how to engage the enemy don't get caught up in any all these fanciful things that you know that all are around us every wind of doctrine that blows through the church don't get caught up with that stay with the word let me close with romans 16 19 and 20 it's on the last slide romans 16 19 and 20 Paul writes to the believers at Rome he says for your obedience has become known to all that means they are walking there are people who are living an obedient life and he says i'm glad about this i'm glad on your behalf then he encourages them in something he says but i want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil so you're an obedient people i'm really encouraged about that i'm really happy about that but i also want to encourage you just stay away from evil just stick with what is good pretty simple be obedient stay away from evil stay with what is good and what will happen verse 20 and the god of peace will crush satan underneath your feet see sometimes we make it so complicated paul made it pretty simple just be obedient stay with what is good stay away from what is evil and what will happen as you keep walking you just find out oh satan you're under me my feet hmm you know the god of peace will crush satan underneath your meaning you will live this life of mastery and dominion and authority and victory over the enemy all you and i need to do is stay obedient stay with what is good stay away from what is that's it the god of peace will crush satan underneath your feet amen let's stand to our feet please you know uh i just realized that uh and we were just looking at what was happening in our different locations and we just found out that you know sometimes uh there are people who attend church who attend our church locations um and we take it for granted that because they keep coming to church that means they are born again that means they have received Christ and we realized last sunday as we were just looking at certain things happening that that may not always be true that there could be people who are attending church very regularly 
uh, but they've never received Jesus into their lives. Uh, and uh, just to make it very plain, sometimes maybe you have a Christian name, unlike mine, or you may, you know, you may have, you know, been part of a church for a long time, and, and you're very, you know, you're, you're very faithful in attending church, and all that is good, but the but Jesus said this, he said, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless a man is born again. So he didn't say unless you go to church regularly. He said, unless you are born again. So I just want to make it as plain and as simple and as clear as possible this morning. You know, that, that sometimes maybe you could be attending church regularly, but you may not have been born again. You may not have received new life. You may not have experienced rebirth in your spirit, meaning being born again, born from above. The life that Jesus wants you to have. And unless you're born again, Jesus said, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So I wonder if there's anybody here, you know, and maybe you've been a Christian from the time you were born. Christian meaning... You grew up in a Christian family. You had a Christian name. Uh, you did all the Christian traditions. All of that is good. But this truth remains the same. Unless a man is born again. How do you get born again? When you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and give you his life. That's how you get born again. Asking him to give you his life. The Bible says whoever receives him to them, he gives the power to become children of God. So when you receive Christ, he gives you the power to become children of God. So I want us to pray that prayer first. If there's anyone here this morning and you've never been born again, you've never received Jesus Christ into your life. You may have been a Christian all your life, but you've never received Jesus into your heart. You never prayed a prayer. You never asked him to come into your life. And I would like to just this morning lead you in a simple prayer where you say, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. I want to be born again. There's even one person here this morning who needs to do that. Would you pray this prayer with me? If you feel the prompting in your heart that you need to do this, would you pray this prayer with me, please? Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I want to be born again. I want this life from above. I want to be a child of God. Forgive my sins. Give me your life. And help me to follow you for the rest of my life. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is anyone here, you prayed this prayer for the very first time, you prayed it with me right now. Could you lift your hand up if you don't mind? Anybody here? See one, anybody else? Wonderful. Anybody else? Two, anybody else? You lift, just lift your hand up. Anybody else? Wow. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. Now, you prayed this prayer. I want to encourage you to read your Bible. I'll teach you more about how to live this new life and how to grow in that. Okay, there's another hand up there. Okay, God bless you. All right? Uh, just, just keep walking with Jesus. Keep growing in the Lord. Amen? All right, let's close in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And we pray, Father, that you will fill our hearts and minds with wisdom. Open our eyes to things unseen. Oh, God, help us to wage warfare with wisdom from above. And Father, I pray that each one of us, as your children, will walk in the victory and in the triumph and in the authority you want us to walk in. That we will live victorious lives. And like your word says, as we walk in obedience, as we pursue what is good and stay away from what is evil, God, we will see the devil crushed underneath our feet over and over again. And in every area of our lives, 
we will say satan you have been defeated in every area of our lives we will say satan you have been defeated and father we thank you for doing this in jesus name amen amen the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship of his holy spirit be with each one of us today and always amen god bless you all thank you for being here have a great sunday see you again god bless we trust that this message was a blessing to you we'd love to hear from you you can email us at contact@apcwo.org at Also visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.